Canadian women who wanted to be pilots during the Second World War had their hopes dashed against a glass ceiling. The Canadian Women's Auxiliary Air Force, established in 1941, opened up dozens of military jobs, but piloting a plane was not one of them. In the Royal Canadian Air Force, women's jobs, apart from clerical and organizational work, are also of a technical nature. These jobs the members of the Women's Division have handled with consistent skill and adaptability. The safety and effectiveness of our forces rest on the new and exciting work performed so conscientiously and brilliantly by Canadian women. Only a handful of determined Canadian women managed a wartime flying career, and they had to leave the country to do it. Helen Harrison earned her license in 1927. She became a commercial pilot and trained reserve pilots for the South African Air Force. When I applied to the RCAF, I was rejected because I wore a skirt, Harrison said. I was furious. I had 2,600 flying hours and instructor's rating multi-engine and instrument endorsements, a seaplane rating, and the experience of flying civil and military aircraft in three countries. Instead, they took men with 150 hours. All the doors were shut, but in 1942, some windows opened. The United States was faced with a severe pilot shortage and began training female pilots as women Air Force service pilots, often referred to by the acronym WASPs. They served everywhere male pilots did, except in combat. They ferried military aircraft, tested overhauled planes, and towed targets for gunnery practice. More than 25,000 women applied, but only 1,800 were accepted, and 1,074 graduated. The lone Canadian known among them was Virginia Lee Warren, who had a key qualification, U.S. citizenship. Born in Canada to American parents, Warren ferried men to a gold mine in Manitoba. She qualified as a wasp in 1943, despite, she said, being two years underage and a quarter inch too short. She went on to ferry planes and qualify as a test pilot. In 1942, the British Air Transport Auxiliary, which ferried wartime aircraft, was not adverse to female pilots. Helen Harrison would become the first Canadian female pilot in the ATA. They were known as Atta Girls. I was happy as a lark and higher than a kite, she said of co-piloting a B-25 Mitchell bomber across the Atlantic. The most difficult part was, she said, using a tube to go to the bathroom. I got a little damp. In 1943, Marion Alice Powell Orr set off for Britain with her fast friend Violet Milstead, where they were delighted to learn that as ATA pilots, they would do the same job as men and earn the same pay. They faced the same dangers, and they flew as many as eight flights a day 
in multiple aircraft types, through fog, storms, and in the darkness of night. They navigated by dead reckoning to avoid radio transmissions in enemy-infested skies. Fifteen of 174 ATA pilots killed were women. Or delivered planes from factories to bases and returning damaged aircraft to repair depots. She flew Harvards, Hurricanes, Spitfires, Ansons, Swordfish, and Tiger Moths. She often saw men pretend to faint when she climbed out of an aircraft. Men seemed to think they had a monopoly on all the air between the earth and heaven, said Orr. Milstead, just over five feet tall, frequently sat atop a rolled up parachute to see out of the cockpit. She flew trainers, fighters, and bombers, four dozen different types of aircraft in all. Good God, girl, a male pilot said to Milstead when she was about to fly a bow fighter for the first time. You can't fly this plane from a book. I can from my book, she replied, or boned up before her first flight in a Spitfire II. You studied the book, start it up, and hope for the best, she said. On takeoff, I was pressed so hard into the seat, I couldn't move. Many female ATA pilots long to fly combat missions. But it was 1987 before women took the controls of Canadian combat aircraft, at long last shattering that glass ceiling. 